Yeah, and it's been a while since the last Breaking Down the Stick episode. But the release of the Mad Cats T3 and the amount of weird excitement I've read on Twitter and even seen on YouTube kind of has me scratching my head. I mean, what am I missing here? It's an unlicensed PC, PS3, and Switch arcade stick that requires a controller to be plugged in for Xbox and PlayStation 4 support. And yes, I did only say PlayStation 4. PlayStation 5 support doesn't exist. Did I really overlook something in their marketing materials? Well, let's tear this thing apart and find out. Alright, first let's talk about the elephant in the room. This thing is $300. Yes, $300. And it's only natively compatible with the Nintendo Switch this generation. And that still requires a button combo to be pressed to force Switch mode. Frankly, this thing is very overpriced for what you get. The TE3 maintains the clamshell design from the TE2 and the TE2 Plus, and this new design reduces the amount of deflection on the top panel, of which the former were infamous. The clamshell lock seems to be improved, but only time will tell if it's truly better. Mad Cats continues to use Sanwa OBSF snap and buttons and a JLF, which remains the standard for mass-produced arcade sticks, but this is about where the positive ends for the TE3. Design, it's very subjective, and while the T3 aesthetic is not for me, this thing is frickin' huge, uh, that's not the point of this video. I want to cover the quality of the stick, the parts, and its modability. The case is all matte finished plastic, and it just doesn't feel premium. It almost feels like uh, an injection molded plastic blown case for cheap power tools. When you open it up, it becomes evident why there's a giant caution sticker warning you to not cut yourself. The grooves and the interlocking ribs aren't very smooth and did leave some scratches on my hands and arms as I was taking things apart. Upon further inspection inside the case, you will notice the underside of the play area has molded plastic and the top panel and plexi kind of drop into it. If you want to swap layouts on this case away from Vulix, you're basically out of luck unless you cut a lot of plastic away and compromise the case's rigidity. The buttons are snap-ins and are nearly impossible to remove without the assistance of a tool to help you press the tabs in. I used the included hex screwdriver to assist me here. Uh, fortunately, they did keep the easy to remove quick disconnects the TE2 series used, so you can press the release clip uh, and slide them off the terminals. The hard part was just getting the PVC jacket out of the way. If you want to use any screw-in buttons, I hate to break it to you, you can't. The molded plastic setup won't let you tighten the nut down. You can see here where I'm trying to install a crown mechanical button unsuccessfully. The lever is a Sanhua JLF as previously mentioned, and given the mounting points and bevel in the plastic housing, moving to a different lever is basically a non-starter if the mounting plate isn't the exact dimensions of that of the JLF. Additionally, the hole where the shaft passes through the case is molded into the plastic, cut into the aluminum panel, and then cut into the plexi as well. Using a high collar Korean lever is going to take a lot of alteration with a step drill bit and a Dremel to work with the TE3. The PCB that runs the stick is located under the covers on the top of the case, and frankly, access to it is kind of a pain. You, you have to remove the visible screws holding it in, then there's like two hidden screws under stickers that, that are difficult to identify as well. Uh, removing the cover for the USB pass-through area was even more challenging because there's screws on that cover plus some screws on the handle itself that hold this entire plastic thing together, and you got to remove all of that. Once you get it all off, you're going to see that the main board's on the left with a touchpad in the middle, and then just an aux board on the right, and then there's little ribbon cables connecting everything together. There's two USB cables attaching the main board to that secondary pass-through board, and that pass-through board has a USB-A connection and a, a Type-C connection. The included cable to connect this up is an A to A cable, which is very weird. Uh, I kind of think they're trying to make this a bad review or bad repair experience down the road by using a USB A to A cable. I, I don't understand why they did this. Looking at the main PCB, the input signals are labeled well and the microprocessor being used is covered in the standard black epoxy, so we can't really figure out what they're using here. If I had to guess, it's probably the same standard microcontroller that every Chinese stick maker uses, but with their own firmware on it. Given what I've seen so far, though, this is probably just a reworked PCB from the GameSir controller that was rebranded as an Ego a few years ago. Uh, but frankly, I'm 
pretty much speculating on this. The placement of all these PCBs and wiring would make modding this with like a Brook PCB or an integrated Pico fighting board pretty difficult. I'm not going to say impossible because you could ditch all the covers and get creative with wiring to make it work, but I really wouldn't invest the time or effort in doing something like this unless you picked up one secondhand for, I don't know, under a hundred bucks and didn't care if the inside looked like a war zone when you were done modding it. Mad Cats is kind of going all in with the marketing on how easy artwork swapping and customization is on this case. They collaborated with Clever Art to create some free art that you can download and put on this if you don't like the stock art, which is cool, I guess. But I think we can all call a spade a spade here and say that if we're just changing artwork, we're really just putting lipstick on a pig at this point. Removing the plexi is easy by removing the six countersinking screws holding it down. The these are actually kind of a nice touch. Uh, I took the buttons out thinking I needed to in order to get this all apart, but it was unnecessary, and I'll explain why later. You do have to remove all the wires connecting to the buttons, though. What is necessary is removing the ball top, and Mad Cats kind of botched this hard. They, they included the screwdriver to remove the plexi screws, but they didn't include a flathead to hold the shaft in order to remove the ball top. The TE2 and the TE2 Plus had a smartly designed double-sided screwdriver to do this, so why didn't they do it again? I can only attribute this to incompetence because they had the right answer in front of them from previous models. Once you remove the ball top, wiring from the buttons and the six screws, you can remove the acrylic with the buttons attached. The buttons only latch onto the plexi by design. This makes art swaps about 5% easier since you don't have to remove the buttons, which is kind of good since they're unnecessarily difficult to pop out with the way this thing's designed. But in the long run, you're relying on just the acrylic to keep your buttons in place and solidly mounted. I'm not sure I really like this approach. Finally, the last thing I looked at was the stick's latency. Using the input lag.science testing method where you use an Arduino Uno and USB shield, I connected the stick up to the testing rig without a dongle controller and tested all three polling rates, the descriptor, native, and overclock. Both the descriptor and native clock came in at four millisecond polling rates and overclock was a one millisecond polling rate. Natively, the average latency was 6.3 milliseconds and 37% of the inputs would skip over one frame. When it was overclocked, the latency did go down to 1.9 milliseconds and only 10% of the inputs would skip one frame. Natively, this thing does not perform well and would be considered very laggy. It's firmly in the bottom half of the controller inputs shared on input lag. Overclocking the polling rate to one millisecond definitely helps and puts it in the top portion of that list, uh, but you have to make sure your PC is set up to pull USB uh, devices at one millisecond and your console supports one millisecond pulling as well. Uh, if it does, that will actually help this stick out immensely. If it doesn't, this thing is kind of slow. All right, so with all the things considered, let's grade this thing on a 4.0 scale. Uh, focused on basic modability. If you're going to swap the ball top, that's pretty easy. Uh, if you're going to swap buttons, I'm going to say this is moderate because it's only compatible with snap-in buttons, uh, and they're hard to get out. I think this is a major whiff by Mad Cats. Swapping levers, it's easy only because it's easy to get to the mounting screws, but the compatibility is poor and very limited on what you can use here. Uh, artwork and plexi swaps, that's actually kind of easy here. Due to the limitations uh, with the stick, I'm going to give this like a 2.8. It's passing, but barely. This is, however, heavily influenced by the limitations of what parts you can actually use, and the 2.8 may be considered generous since it's limited to only really one type of button. All right, now let's talk about advanced modability, and this is kind of my important part here. Uh, changing layouts, this is hard, and it's gonna require extensive cutting of materials that could destroy the case or really affect its uh, quality overall. Swapping the PCB, I also say this is probably very hard, only because of the tight integration with the case and all of the tedious work to design a custom PCB or tap into signals and dual mod the stock PCB. It's just not super friendly in any of these ways. Uh, for this, I have to give this thing a zero. The T3 fails hard at anything beyond basic modding, and unlike the TE and the TE2, I think the T3, it's just not going to have a long lifespan supported by aftermarket parts and mod kits. We're not going to look fondly back on this stick in five to ten years. I'm pretty sure of that. 
All right, and finally, overall quality. I think Mad Cat's tried, but it's worth noting that this is not the same company that gave us the Versus series, the TE, or the TE2. I'm not really convinced they have anyone on staff that really has invested themselves into the FGC and knows what people really want. The TE3 feels like a toy and just not a $300 premium arcade stick. The limited compatibility and the workarounds they put in place to gain console compatibility, it's just kind of silly. Serious competitors aren't going to use this stick, and for overall quality, I give this thing maybe a 1.5. Would I buy this stick? Well, for $100 to maybe $125, I probably would, but only if it was marketed as a PC-only stick and dropped the pass-through functions. It would be a great beginner stick if you were starting out, and it does offer some runway to make minor customizations, but as it stands now, though, absolutely not. This is a hard pass, and with the cost of mass-produced sticks rising this generation, it's probably time to seriously look at getting a custom build from a smaller builder or hobbyist. I think they're probably doing better than most at this point. Jasonscustoms.com For the community for the win.